We now enter the uh, period of cross-examination, which trial-like allows the questioner to pose and the answer only to answer and not to repeat the question or to dodge. Six minutes of questions begin to Dr. Craig, followed by six, question, six minutes of questions to Mr. Hitchens. Dr. Craig, your questions for Mr. Hitchens. All right. Let's talk first about whether there are any good arguments to think that atheism is true. Now, it seems to me that you're rather ambivalent here that you say, you, you, you redefine atheism to mean a sort of atheism or non-theism. Yeah, that's, that's what it means. Um, but how do you distinguish then the different varieties of non-theism? For example, what is normally called atheism, agnosticism, or the view of verificationists that uh, the statement God exists is simply meaningless. Well, I mean, there are different schools of atheism, as you say, but the, the, there's, no, there's no claim I know how to make that says atheism is true, because atheism is the statement that a certain proposition isn't true. So uh, I wish you'd get this bit right, um, because I'm, it's there you go again. Well, I, 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 I just devoted a little time to this. I said it, it's a, it is not in itself a belief or a system. It simply says you can get by uh, better, probably, we think, um, without the assumption and that no one who wants you to worship a god has ever been able to come up with a good enough reason to make you do it. Uh, now, so, so the, the point is, though, that on your definition of, of uh, atheism or non-theism, it really embodies a diversity of views such as agnosticism, what is normally called atheism, or this uh, verificationism. Now, which of those do you hold to within this umbrella of atheism? Are you uh, an atheist who asserts the proposition God does not exist, or do you simply withhold belief in God in the way the agnostic does? Right. I'm a, I'm in some, on some days, um, I'm a greater... <laughs> I'm a, no, I'm not gonna, no, I'm not gonna do you that much of a favor. Um, <laughs> On some, on some days, I'm a great admirer of Thomas Huxley, who had the great, uh, who, who had the great debate with Bishop Wilberforce um, in Oxford at the Natural History Museum about Darwinism um, in the mid-19th uh, century, and who was known as uh, Darwin's bulldog. We would now say Darwin's pit bull, um, and who completely trounced the good bishop. Um, but I can't thank him for inventing the term agnostic. And I can't thank him for some of his social Darwinist positions either, which are some of which are rather unattractive. Now, I, I need an answer to this. My time yeah. is fleeting. But because because I, think, I think agnosticism is evasive. To me, yes, if you, if you talk about the power of the Holy Spirit and so forth, to me, that is meaningless. It's, it's to me, I'm sorry, I've tried. It's white noise. It's like saying there is only one God and Allah is his messenger. It's gibberish to me. The, what, there, what there, are many, there are many of us, I'm sorry, there are just many of us to whom, of whom this is the case. It may be true, it is true. Okay, the Mr. Religion, Hitchens, I've I, I yeah. got to press you here again because oh, time is fleeting. Feel free. What, what is your view exactly? Press away. Do, you do, do you affirm God does not I think exist once, or I think, do you simply I think once, I, I think once I have said that I've never seen any persuasive evidence for the existence of something and I've made real attempts to study the evidence presented and the arguments presented, that I will, I will go as far as to say, have the nerve to say, uh, that it does not therefore exist, except in the minds right. of its, so, except, except in the, uh, the uh, Henry Jamesian uh, subjective sense that you say of it being in, so real to some people in their own minds that, all right, it, yeah, that it counts as a force in the world, yes. Okay, so you, you do affirm then that God does not exist. Now what I want to know, and do you have any justification for that? I think I've, I've come unwired no, in some you're horrible still, way. You're fine. Are you sure? Do, do you have any any arguments leading to the conclusion that God does not exist? Well, I would rather, I think, I'm, I'm wondering if I'm boring anybody now. I would rather, I would rather say, uh, I'd rather state it in reverse and say, I, I find all the arguments in favor to be fallacious or unconvincing. And I'd have to add that though this isn't my reason for not believing in it, that I would be very depressed if it was true. But that's a quite different thing. I, I don't, I, I don't say of atheism that it's at all morally superior. That would be very risky. I wouldn't admit that it was at all morally inferior either, but we can at least be acquitted on the charge of wishful thinking. I wonder, I wonder if that's the case. Would you agree that the absence of evidence is not evidence of absence? Well, you know, I'm not sure that I would agree. Okay. 
Let's turn no, to the I moral mean, argument I, I think, and talk about that a little bit. I think you've, under, you've misunderstood the moral argument. When given, you, I mean, given the stakes, Dolce, sorry. Given the stakes, I mean, you're not saying, we're not talking about unicorns or tooth fairies or leprechauns here. We're talking about uh, an authority that would give other human beings the right to tell me what to do in the name of God. So for, for a claim like that, if there's no evidence for it, um, it seems to me a, a very, uh, very uh, uh, not, a, not a small question. No, um, it's certainly not a small question. Because you're I making a very, means... very, very large claim. Your evidence had better be absolutely magnificent, it seems to me. And it's the lack of magnificence, I think, that began to strike me first. One final question, Doctor. <laughs> okay, well, let's go to the moral argument. It seems to me there that you've misunderstood the argument in that we're looking for an objective foundation for the moral values and duties that we, want, we both, I think, want to affirm. It's not a matter of whether or not we can know what is right and wrong or that we need God to tell us what is right and wrong. It's rather that we need to have some sort of an objective foundation for right and wrong. Wouldn't you agree on your view, it's simply the socio-biological spin-offs of the evolutionary process and that therefore these do not provide any sort of objective foundation for moral values and duties. Uh, that, that could be true, yes. That okay. could well be true. Yeah, I don't want to be too much of a reductionist, but it's, it's, in, it's entirely possible that it is purely evolutionary and functional. One wants to think that there's a bit more to one's love for the fellow creature than that. But it's, it's, it doesn't add one iota of weight or, or moral gravity to the argument to say, but, but that's because I don't believe in a supernatural being. It just, it's a non sequitur. Mr. Hitchens, your question's for Dr. Craig. Ah, well, um, I'd like to know first, you said um, um, that the, the career of Jesus of Nazareth involved the ministry of miracles and exorcisms. When you say exorcism, do you mean that you believe in devils too? What I meant there was that most historians agree that Jesus of Nazareth practiced miracle working and he practiced exorcisms. I'm not committing myself, nor are historians committing themselves to the reality of demons, but they are saying that Jesus uh, did practice exorcism and he practiced uh, uh, healing. So you believe that uh, Jesus of Nazareth caused devils to leave the body of a madman and go into a flock of pigs that hurled themselves down the Gadarene slopes into the sea. Do I believe that is, that's historical? Yes. Right. That would be sorcery, wouldn't it, though? No, it would be an illustration of Jesus' ability to command even the forces of darkness, and therefore an illustration of the sort of divine authority that he was able to command and exercise. This, as I say, is illustrative of this unprecedented sense of divine authority that Jesus of Nazareth had, that he even could command the forces of darkness and, and that they would obey. So whether you think he was a genuine exorcist or that he merely believed himself to be an exorcist, what is historically undeniable is that he had this radical sense of divine authority which he expressed by miracle working and exorcisms. Right. And do you, and you believe he was, he was born of a virgin? Um, I, yes, I believe that as a Christian. I couldn't claim to prove that historically. That's not part of my case tonight. But I, 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 as a Christian, I believe that. And I know you believe in the resurrection, but as a matter of biblical, what should we call it, um, consistency, um, it's said in one of the Gospels that at the time of the crucifixion, all the graves of Jerusalem were opened and all the tenants of the graves walked the streets and greeted their old friends. It makes the resurrection sound rather a commonplace in the greater Jerusalem area. It's a, it, that's in the Gospel of Matthew, and that's actually attached to a crucifixion narrative. That's where, what I said. It says at the time of the crucifixion. That's yes, correct. that's right. At the time of the crucifixion, it says that there were appearances of Old Testament saints in Jerusalem at the time. This is part of Matthew's uh, description of the crucifixion scene. Do, I mean, do you believe that? I don't know whether Matthew intends this to be apocalyptic imagery or whether he means this to be taken literally. I'm, I've not studied it in any depth, and I'm open-minded about it. I'm... I'm willing to be convinced one way or the other. You'll see, you'll see the reason I'm pressing you is this because, I mean, we know from Scripture that the pharaohs, the magicians, could produce miracles. In the end, Aaron could outproduce them. But I'm say, what I'm suggesting to you is even if the laws of nature can be suspended and, and great, great miracles can be performed, um, it doesn't prove the truth of the doctrine of the person who's, who's performing them. 
Or do um, you, would you not agree to that? Not necessarily. I think that's right. So somebody could be casting out devils from pigs, and that wouldn't prove he was the son of God. I, I think that's right. In fact, there were Jewish exorcists. The only point that I was trying to make there was that this was illustrative of the kind of divine authority that Jesus claimed, especially since he didn't cast them out what if, yeah. in God's name, where he didn't perform miracles by praying to God. He would do them in his own authority. So that Jesus exercised an authority that was simply unheard of at that time and for which he was eventually crucified because it was thought to be blasphemous. Well, it was thought to be blasphemous to claim to be the Messiah, to be exact. I mean, the people who got the closest look at him, the Jewish Sanhedrin, were, were thought that he, his claims were not genuine. So remember, if you're resting anything on eyewitnesses, the ones who we definitely know were there uh, thought he was bogus. But, okay, I think I've got a rough idea, assuming you make that assumption uh, uh, of his pre-existing divinity, that it's a presuppositionalist case, I can see what you're driving at. Well, no, I'm, I'm not got a another question. No, I've got another question for you, which is this. How many religions in the world do you believe to be false? I don't know how many religions in the world there are, so I well, can't... Well, could it. you name... <laughs> well, fair enough. I'll, I'll see if I can't narrow that down. I, <laughs> a, that was a clumsily asked question, I admit. Uh, do, you, are, do you regard any of the world's religions to Excuse be false? Excuse me. Do you regard any of the world's religions to be false preaching? Yes, yes, I think, yeah, certainly. Would you name one then? Islam. Uh, that's quite a lot. Pardon me? That's quite a lot. Yes. Do you, therefore, do you think it's moral to preach false religion? No. So religion is responsible for quite a lot of wickedness in the world right there. Certainly. Right. I'd be happy to concede that. I, I would agree with that. So if I, was to be, if I was a baby being born in Saudi Arabia today, would you rather I was me or a Wahhabi Muslim? Would, would I be, you would rather you, be what? Would you rather, would you rather it was me, it was an atheist baby or um, a Wahhabi baby? <laughs> uh, I, I, I don't have any uh, preferences to whether you would... You do. As, as, as bad as that, okay. Are there any, are there any, are there any, I must, I'm oh, sorry, I must, I've only got a few seconds, it's, it's a serious question, I shouldn't squander it. Are there any Christian denominations you regard as false? Certainly. Could I know what they are? Um, well, uh, I, I'm not a Calvinist, for example. I think that uh, certain tenets of Reformed theology are incorrect. I would be uh, more in the Wesleyan camp myself. But these are differences among brethren. These are not differences uh, on which we need to put one another in some sort of a cage. So within the Christian camp, there's a large diversity of perspectives. I'm sure there are views that I hold that are probably false. But I'm trying my best to, to get my theology straight, trying to do the best job, but I think all of us would recognize that none of us agree on every point of Christian doctrine, on, on every uh, uh, dot and tittle. Before Mr. Hitchin succeeds in launching another series of religious wars among Christians, let's get to the... <laughs> <laughs> let's get to the responses. Seven minutes are each. Dr. Craig, it is your seven minutes. Okay. 